Next, we will hear from Dr. David Bushnell, who is a radiologist, uh, actually a radiologist's radiologist, who works at Iowa with Dr. Odoricio. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, for inviting me. I I just uh, Tom handed me his uh, phone there, and I just realized that he and I are the only two physicians at the University of Iowa that ha still have flip phones. Uh, so I, I've been following his coattail on his coattails for 15 years, and even on technology issues, I refer uh, to, to him. A few of the slides that I have will probably overlap just a little bit. Tom and I come from Iowa. How many of you can pick out Iowa on the map? Oh, well, that, that's not bad. Um, so, uh, it, whoops, uh, yeah, I, okay. Hey, oh, thank you so much. Uh, so, there, well, there we are. Um, there's Iowa. We're, we're known for uh, corn. We're also known for uh, pork. Um, th these little guys grew up uh, to become very tasty. And um, this year, we're, we're no, we've, had a, we've had some floods, the whole country does, but this is the uh, main entrance into Iowa City and the university. And you can see the street in front of this dormitory is flooded completely. That was this uh, June, and so there was a sandbag crew, and uh, that's, you know, in Iowa, we, we pitch in and, and help out and, and help each other, and so, of course, I jumped in there, and uh, you can see I was sandbagging. Uh, Tom, Tom wasn't there, but I was there. <laughs> um, my daughter lives in Ireland, and uh, I go there often, and... I like the Irish, so I like their approach to flooding. Uh, uh, that's, that's what I think we're going to try and try to do a little bit more of that uh, in Iowa City. So neuroendocrine tumors, as, as you know, can occur in a variety of locations. Primaries in the lung, uh, bowel, intestine, pancreas, metastatic disease, liver, uh, skeleton, regional lymph nodes uh, and lungs. And so how do we find them? Well, imaging techniques have uh, represented the cornerstone for detecting a location of primary tumors and a metastatic or disseminated disease. Um, so I wanted to touch on today uh, some of these imaging methodologies and how they're used and what their role might be. CT probably the most important imaging technique for identifying, at least initially, identifying the primary tumor in a, in a patient who has a neuroendocrine tumor. MRI has, it has some possibilities and it's occasionally used. There are some downsides to MRI. CT is so fast now that we can scan the chest, abdomen, and pelvis in a matter of minutes, uh, just a few minutes. MRI is much slower. It takes uh, quite a bit longer. There are some limitations as well with bowel motility. And then I'll talk a little bit about molecular radionuclide imaging, and PET-CT would be the focus primarily, um, although SPEC-CT with Octrea scan has been so important and around for some time, I think, um, and I'm, and I'm going to make this uh, statement, even though I know that the Malincrat people will probably tail me all the way back to Iowa City since they make Octrea scan. PET-CT with the gallium-68 Octrea peptides almost certainly will take the place of Octrea scan in the coming uh, few years, I think. PET-MRI is an interesting methodology. Uh, just mention it to you. I don't know where it's going to go. It's received a lot of attention and um, it has some possibilities. These are some of the radiopharmaceuticals that you may be familiar with that we use targeting neuroendocrine tumors, both for therapy and for imaging. And of course, Octrea scan at the top of the list there. But I'll talk primarily about um, 
I'll talk primarily about uh, the gallium octreopeptides and uh, pluridioxyglucose. Uh, PET imaging with FDG uh, plays an important uh, role, I think, as well in uh, some cases. Uh, a number of these other agents maybe I'll mention uh, if time uh, permits. What is CT? So an X-ray computed tomography system is simply a, a machine designed to have an X-ray beam uh, go through the patient, through a patient, strike a bank of detectors, and this setup spins around the patient very fast uh, and, as a matter of fact, finishes, as I mentioned, an image of the abdomen in a matter of a minute or two. CT imaging, uh, and then creates, as many of you have seen, uh, these axial slices, so slices through the body. We also look at other planes and other orientations, the axial slices being perhaps the most important, though, or at least most commonly used. Uh, this is an example of a CT scan through an axial slice. Now, with CT imaging, it's, it's really crucial to use a contrast medium. So we have the individual drink uh, an, an agent or substance that will attenuate x-rays in the GI tract. And then we also inject in the vein uh, contrast material that will help us to outline the vascular structures. Uh, and so if you've ever had a CT scan, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I've had one, you get kind of a hot flushing feeling from the contrast agent that's injected into the dye, but it helps us to identify the vascular structures, and because neuroendocrine tumors are so vascular, it helps us in some cases to identify the tumor uh, as well. The white arrow here points to a modestly vascular neuroendocrine tumor uh, of the stomach. And notice that the, and I don't know if the pointer works, and, and I'm scared to punch any other button here. Um, the kidneys, I think, for those who have seen CTs, the kidneys are very bright white there, and that's because they're taking the dye and they're excreting it. And so they, they actually have lots of enhancement. The tumor has a little bit of enhancement uh, because of its vascularity. Now here's a CT image of the liver, and it's in a particular phase of imaging. There's a little bit of contrast agent in the liver. But here is, and it's a little hard to see, I realize, if you look where the black arrows are, they're pointing to regions that look a little whiter, a little brighter, and that's because the tumor uh, is, is highly vascular, and this is an arterial phase of the CT scan sequence. So we didn't see it on the other phase, but we see it on this phase. CT imaging in different phases with the contrast is vital for detecting not only the primary tumor, but metastatic disease. Surgeons really uh, rely on uh, much of the information from CT in making initial decisions about the type of surgery, whether to do surgery. And I apologize, I don't have an arrow or a pointer. There is a, a large tumor here. It's a mesenteric node. It's sort of in the middle of the, um, of the study. It's going to maybe be hard for me to point out. But the CT is also showing extensive fibrosis and uh, scarring associated with the tumor, which is critical for the surgeon when he or she decides the type of resection or procedure that they're going to perform. I hope you can see this. Uh, CT imaging is also important for evaluating response to therapy. Sometimes MR can be used but CT remains probably the most relied upon technique uh, for resist assessment of response to therapy. This patient had an insulinoma, was treated with three cycles of yttrium dotatoc. The pre-therapy scan is on the left. And I think you, if you look at the liver, you can see the sort of modestly darker regions that go away on the post-therapy scan. And this patient had a near complete response uh, to the yttrium dotatoc therapy. You might be able to see it a little bit better here. 
The CT scan on the left shows the liver and the, the little T's, there's T's in the tumor, uh, on the pre-therapy or baseline scan on the left, and then on the post-yttrium therapy liver image on the right, those tumor regions are dramatically uh, reduced in size. This patient was categorized as having a partial response based on CT. So what about the idea of putting CT and PET together into one machine? That's really been the reality now for five or six years. Most institutions across this the country have uh, PET CT machines. PET standalone machines um, really don't uh, essentially exist anymore, except pet, potentially in pediatrics where radiation uh, exposure is a little bit more of an issue. Positron tomography, so you have a, you have a radionuclide and it shoots out a positron and the positron uh, uh, combines with an electron, and then a couple of gamma rays come out. So that gallium-68 that Dr. Odoricio mentioned fires out a positron. It annihilates with an electron. Two gammas come out, and we detect it with a bank of gamma-detecting uh, detectors that really form the basis for a positron emission tomography unit. Here's a neuroendocrine tumor cell. And uh, I'd like to touch uh, a little bit on the receptors and sites for targeting for imaging and therapy as well. Uh, we'll look at the somatostatin receptor, um, the somatostatin receptor agents first, and then touch perhaps on FDG and fluorodopa. As a review, somatostatin receptors, primarily five subtypes. Uh, located and expressed on the surface of neuroendocrine tumor cells. And these are proteins. They, they span the, the expanse of the uh, membrane on the neuroendocrine tumor cell. Once they bind with the targeting agents that we are generally using, the complex of the transporter, the somatostatin agent, uh, and the somatostatin receptor internalizes into the cell, and that's good for both imaging purposes and for therapy purposes. Indium penetriotide, so Octrea scan, primarily targets 2 and 5. It turns out that TOC and Tate gallium target 2 and 5 as well, but they do so with much greater affinity. And finally, there is another agent that's been studied extensively in Europe, uh, Dota NOC, which I think may have a unique niche as well as time, as we evaluate these agents um, and time goes on, because it targets the third type of somatostatin receptor. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Odoricio sort of gone, uh, has gone over, um, let me just, these slides before, let me just point out um, that if you can see it, uh, Dotatoc is on the bottom, Octrea scan is on the top. Uh, Tom pointed out the difference between those two agents. Um, Dotatate, uh, so gallium dotatate, but dotatate as a molecule is very similar to Dotatoc. It has the same amino acid sequence in the octreopeptide, and it differs only with a double bond oxygen on the last amino acid in the sequence, but that's enough to change the binding affinity. Doesn't take much of an alteration of these molecules to have a substantial effect on the binding. The binding, by the way, takes place at the somatostatin receptor primarily with those, uh, those two amino acids you can see at the very tip, the tryptophan TRP and the lysine LYS. We're gonna, we'll skip over Dota not. It's a little bit of a difference. Um, make, so, so getting a hold of a, a gallium generator is not too hard to do. They're commercially available. So we can make the gallium, and then uh, the lab doesn't have to be very big. We have a couple of units, a modular unit that uses some cassettes, and we can put together the gallium-68 and the dotatoc molecule uh, for injection into the patient. Now, the, the great thing about these agents is they're simple. They, you can, we can inject them. Uh, into uh, the vein, and that's it. And it's a pretty slick, uh, 
a pretty slick thing. So it's intravenous. Uh, now I have had uh, a technologist and uh, back when, when I was a resident a year or two ago, I did this once myself. You, you can actually make a mistake and inject the radiopharmaceutical into the artery, um, which, um, it, it, which really is, is okay, and the images turn out fine, and it works out real well, unless, it, it, as the slide shows, you're a mosquito. So, uh, as Tom, I think, pointed out, imaging with gallium-68 has the advantage that after injecting in the vein, about 60 minutes later, we can do the imaging procedure. You know, Octrio scan, it's four hours later, and then importantly, it's 24 hours later again. Uh, gallium, one hour wait, image, imaging takes about a half hour, and we get a whole body PET study and a whole body uh, non-contrast CT. Now, protocols for PET CT probably should incorporate um, uh, intravenous contrast, that's something that still needs to be worked out in terms of optimizing PET-CT with gallium octreotide agents. Uh, Tom actually uh, showed you one of these three studies. Um, there are a couple of others out there. The bottom line, without going into the methodology, uh, was that all three of the studies compared gallium octreopeptides, either Tate or TOC, to Octrea scan, all three studies had the same conclusion, and that was that gallium PET was the superior somatostatin receptor imaging agent, uh, and that eventually we should switch, when we can, uh, uh, to that agent preferentially. I don't think uh, Dr. Odorisio showed you this case, but I'll show you. It's a little bit unfair to Octrea scan because the image on the left uh, is not tomography, it's whole body, it's planar. It's compared to a 3D image, uh, or what we call a MIP image of Dota Toc gallium on the right. And I think, though, that it's so dramatically uh, better. So you just, you, you see the improved resolution so much better with gallium Dota Toc that it, it's easy, I think, for us to understand why studies show this is the superior somatostatin receptor, and I'm going to kind of skip this slide, agent. Um, here's another uh, comparison. This was a case, this is an Octrea scan, anterior on the left, posterior image on the right, uh, and in the middle below the liver and spleen on the anterior image, you see that sort of dark black uh, blob? That's the primary tumor in the small intestine that was well visualized. It, this is the, the tomographic set of images from the same study. You can kind of see a black area in the center of those images. That's the primary. Liver, everything else looks really good. The patient went to surgery. The primary was removed. Two months later, he continued to have some symptoms. And so a gallium Dota Tox study was performed. And I'm going to hit these so I, think, so I think you can see them a little better. If you look at the blue circles, you can see little dark spots in those blue circles. And those are metastatic lesions not seen on the SPECT Octrea scan that now, two months later, are identified uh, on the gallium-68 Dota Tox study. I believe the patient went back, and those lesions were resected by the surgeon at a second surgery. By the way, uh, another lesion did show up on the Octrea uh, on the gallium octrea peptide study, and it was located in the spine, as you can see, a little bit you can see there on the MRI that was done as well. So um, Dr. Odoricio talked about unknown primary detection, um, and in fact, I think he might have shown this case, so I'll quickly go over it. Uh, this study was done in a patient who had a negative CT and negative MR, and a negative SPECT Octrea scan. The primary tumor was identified in the ascending colon on gallium dotatoc PET. Another case where uh, this is the, these are the frontal plane tomography slices from gallium uh, dotatoc, and you can see, if you look at the liver, you see all sorts of dark spots in the liver. That, those represent metastatic lesions. Let me get some feedback. 
But in addition, what was not seen on CT and what was not seen on Octrea scan, uh, you can see with the blue arrow in the that's in the tail of the pancreas. That blue arrow found the primary tumor in this case as well, where all other imaging techniques were uh, negative. Tom talked about the importance of management. Well, you know, okay, we find more tumors, we find more sites, but does that affect overall patient care? This was a study, uh, I forget where it was from, published recently. The dark blue piece of the pie represents the fraction of patients who had a substantial management change as indicated by uh, either the endocrinologist, the oncologist, or the surgeon taking care of the patient. Uh, and so you can see about half of individuals who underwent gallium dota talk or take, take uh, uh, were felt uh, by the caring clinician uh, to have, uh, it, he had changed or she had changed the management based on the dota tape results. Sometimes uh, dota tape will find an unusual uh, uh, site for metastatic disease. Here's a lesion we found uh, behind the eye. This patient was actually treated with lutetium dota tape. Um, I may or may not be allowed to show this uh, slide, but well, there it is. And uh, uh, so, in fact, after the, the lutate, there was a little bit of swelling that took place in the lesion, uh, and there were some symptoms that developed, but they went away quickly, uh, and the patient responded very nice to lutate. This was an unusual case where the patient had, and, and this will se let me segue into FDG. The patient had both FDG imaging, so, so we're taking a picture of glucose, and I'll mention it just a little bit more on the next slide, with PET on the left. And then the gallium dota talk image on the right, and you can see a lot of black, two, uh, black lesions uh, there on the FDG study, but the dota talk image on the right doesn't really show anything at all. Uh, so that told us that this probably was not um, a neuroendocrine tumor, although this individual years before had had a neuroendocrine tumor resected. Um, it turned out this individual had an unusual situation where uh, the uptake on the FDG was due to fungal, disseminated fungal disease. So that's not good. Uh, back, okay, back to our neuroendocrine tumor site. So let's look at FDG. So FDG, um, as it turns out, has receptors. It, it gets transported into neuroendocrine tumor cells and other malignant cells. Uh, and, and, and in fact, the idea that glucose is used preferentially by tumors has been around for about 80 years. And it uh, wasn't until the late 80s, I think, that we really began to utilize glucose imaging with PET to identify malignancy. Here's an example. If you look at the image on the far right, it's a combination of a CT uh, PET study with glucose, radio-labeled glucose, and the yellow uh, uh, lesions in the chest with the white arrows represent the malignancy that is taking up the glucose uh, in this case. You can see, notice the, and, and these are going to be small letters, but the heart, uh, the brain, uh, both have high glucose utilization as well normally, and you can see kidney there on the image as well. This is an example. I, I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through because I might, I may be, a little long-winded here. So let me just say that what we found with FDG is that it, it does not by any means detect nearly as many uh, neuroendocrine tumors as does gallium dotatate or dotatoc. But the ones that it does detect are very high, are higher grade. And so, so it's not so useful necessarily for identifying where the tumor is. Can be helpful there. But rather, it may help us um, non-invasively determine how aggressive the tumor is going to be. The grade 1 tumors are very typically negative with FDG or glucose. The grade 2 and 3 tumors are very uh, uh, typically positive with FDG or, or glucose. And so, in fact, studies have found that the level of FDG uptake on the PET predicts how severe the disease is, the outcome, the prognosis. And studies have been done where they've looked at head-to-head -head, 
FDG uptake in the tumor versus KI-67 levels from the primary tumor tissue, and they found, in fact, that the patient outcome was better predicted by how much glucose was taken up in the malignancy as opposed to the KI-67 fraction. And to a large extent, this is a slide that Dr. Odoricio put together for his neuroendocrine tumor clinic, and I, it's going to be a little bit hard for you to see, but in the black box at the bottom, he has, okay, what do I do if the FDG is positive and the and in patient that's a non-operable patient, so the tumor has spread to the point where surgery is not an option. What do I do if FDG is positive and the dotatoc is negative? Well, those patients typically uh, go on to have chemotherapy. Vice versa, if the uh, if the dotatoc is positive and the FDG is negative, those patients uh, he will typically send on for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, either in a clinical trial like the Lutate trial or uh, to Europe uh, for treatment uh, there. Here's an individual. This is an Octrea scan. You can see on the insert there, that's the tomographic part of the Octrea scan. You can see the, the little black ball in the middle. That's the primary tumor. Um, this primary tumor was resected. FDG study, an FDG study was done and compared uh, to the Octrea scan. This is, yeah, this is Octrea scan. And if you look at the top, the Octrea scan CT uh, is negative. You don't see any yellow dots there. But if you look at the FDG, uh, uh, CT FDG scan there, you see the two yellow tumor deposits in the liver. And this individual was then therefore referred for chemotherapy because the uh, octreal peptide study was negative. And here is the before chemotherapy FDG on the upper left and the after uh, chemotherapy FDG on the lower right. And you can see those two yellow dots are not as bright. And one is essentially gone completely. And so this individual did it sp respond at least for a time to the chemotherapy that was used. Let me mention DOPA um, a, 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 before we, we end. How are we doing on time? I'm probably going too far here. Um, thank you. Um, let me mention DOPA. So there was a study, there have been several studies with fluorodopa. Uh, and I, if I, yeah, here's our cell. So uh, if you look at DOPA there uh, on the top of the cell, it, it gets transported very actively into these neuroendocrine tumor cells with uh, upregulated amino acid transporter systems. And a number of studies have been done, one of which concluded in comparison to Octrea scan that DOPA, fluorodopa, would be the optimal imaging technique in the future, particularly for mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I don't know really whether we can say uh, fluorodopa will turn out to be more effective than the gallium PET-CT studies at this point. It may be that they'll, they'll turn out to be complementary to some extent. Here's a 3D PET image of a patient with a mid-gut uh, neuroendocrine tumor with metastatic disease to the liver, uh, the dark spots, and to the skeletal system as depicted on this fluorodopa study. And here is a study in which, if you look, um, the DOPA study is sort of in the center, and the Octrea scan is on the left, and you can see a number of intense lesions that are depicted on the DOPA study. The co-registered CT is uh, identified D, image D down there, and there's a little red arrow that points to a positive, DOPA-positive lesion, and you don't see that on the Octrea peptide study uh, uh, box C. Um, so MIBG, MIBG has a role potentially as well, although, uh, and Dr. Campo has extensive experience using this agent to treat patients uh, uh, with neuroendocrine tumors. I don't know that it is going to have a very big role on detecting tumors, but it, it may have an important imaging with MIBG may be important, is important for determining what individuals would be eligible for therapy with I-131 MIBG uh, that Dr. Campo 
uses successfully. So I think um, in I, I did want to mention MRI, um, although we're running out of time real quick. So an MRI machine, big magnet, big magnetic field, and an electromagnetic radio wave is pulsed at you when you're inside the magnet. That radio wave flips the protons, and then when the protons in the body flip back, they send out a signal that's detected and turned in to an image. And here are two different kinds of MRI images that demonstrate metastatic disease in the liver. By the way, MRI imaging is probably uh, better than CT and, and essentially it is good as, as gallium dotate in the liver for identifying metastatic disease. It's, it's exceptional in that area. It has limitations for identifying the primary tumor. But you can see the big dark areas in this patient uh, on one kind of MR, and then you can see the bright areas. Those are the same tumors, and it's just a different way that the MR signaling has been uh, conducted. Here was a case where we had to use MR to follow the response to yttrium dotatoc therapy as opposed to CT because the CT of the liver was negative and so we couldn't use it in terms of response to therapy. This patient, by the way, uh, was categorized as having stable disease after uh, treatment with yttrium dotatoc. So uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, teamwork. Um, I want to point out uh, here that I'm the guy, so you know, I, I really am on the work with two superstars, Tom and Sue Odoricio, and then the rest of the team. I've hung onto their coattails on them. So uh, that's me on the bottom, and, and, then, and then Tom is, uh, you know, and I do whatever I can to help him out. Thank you so much. Yeah.